Good evening. Thank you so much for being our guest participants this evening. We have a wonderful crowd of people here and so many friends of um, our uh, star, uh, Artemis. And I know we have friends of Jeremy's as well. So my name is Miriam Klein Kasanoff. And I'm the founder of the film series, Screening the Holocaust, which is in partnership with the Miami Jewish Film Festival, the Sue and Leonard Miller Center for Contemporary Judaic Studies at the University of Miami, the George Feldenkrais Program, and the Holocaust Memorial on Miami Beach, and of course, my own Holocaust Teacher Institute at the University of Miami. And tonight we are partnering with Jeremy Nezov and Facing History and ourselves. I am honored on behalf of my parents. Are you in a swimming pool? <laughs> I am honored on behalf of my parents to be introducing uh, uh, my partners, not my parents. Artemis threw me off with the swimming pool to be introducing and moderating this evening a discussion on the beautiful film, Defying the Nazis, with our outstanding guest, co-director with Ken Burns, Artemis Jalowski of the film, and we hope a little later on, Emily Holmstrom, a survivor who was saved by the Sharps, who was one of the triplets starring in the film, and Jeremy Nezoff, Senior Director of District Partnerships and Interim Director, Jewish Education Department, Staff Director, Educator for Facing History and Ourselves. So with that, let's begin. Now, I'm going to assume and hope that most of the people on tonight saw this wonderful film because I don't want to waste any time or spend time going over the summary of what the film was about. But very quickly, very quickly, I will just tell you that Artemis's grandparents, Reverend Waitzel and Martha Sharp, were American Unitarians who visited um, the Unitarian Church in Prague, Czechoslovakia, throughout the 20s and 30s. But when Czechoslovakia fell to the Nazis in 1938, the American Unitarian Association chose to send commissioners to assess the needs of the refugees and the Prague Church. Reverend Whitestill and Martha Sharp were very distraught what was happening in Europe. After all, these were people that were their friends. So, leaving their children, their young children, very reluctantly at home in America, the Sharps arrived in Prague in 1939, the very day that the Nazis marched in. And from there, the film goes on to show the amazing selfless work that this couple did to save children, particularly Jewish, refugee children from the Holocaust. I'm going to start with you, Artemis. I have seen this film quite a few times, and each time I'm absolutely amazed all over again at the absolute noble and humanitarian efforts on the part of your grandparents, Waitzel and Martha Sharp, who actually left their home and their children in America to go to Europe. Let's begin this discussion with how and when did you first discover this story? And then tell us what was your personal relationship with your grandparents? Well, first of all, Miriam, thank you for inviting me and Jeremy uh, to this incredible occasion of your work and your network and to Igor and the other members of the team, Ava, uh, Avi, I mean, um, I just think, you know, we're so lucky that you've made this happen. 
uh, for the world. And we're also recording it, which makes me happy as well. So people can watch it who can't join today. Um, but you know, the whole story really begins with uh, facing history in ourselves. Because I was asked as a child, um, a facing history in ourselves kind of question. In my ninth grade at Ellen Stevenson School, uh, my teacher asked me to interview someone of moral courage. And I said, wow, what, what is that? <laughs> and I went home and I said, mom, I gotta do a paper on moral courage. Who should I interview? And she said, go talk to your grandmother. She has some interesting stories for you. And I said, what, what did she do? And I was like, I mean, what did she really do? Did she like create the atomic bomb or something? Like, wow. And I get to her apartment and this stately old woman welcomes me at the door like, you know, uh, Greta Garbo, brings me into her beautifully cherry uh, library, says, do you have a tape recorder? I said, yes. She said, let's start at the beginning. Bang. And for two hours, I basically learned the story that you've all learned in the film. So wait a minute, Artemis, let me get this straight. How old were you? 14. So prior to that day, although you had visited your grandmother often? Never, never. We never, they never told you the story? I grew up in Italy. I grew up in Lebanon and I grew up in Hong Kong and I never saw these grandparents. And this is the part that's so painful about the story is that my grandparents divorced each other, remarried other people, and when oh. I was together with them, they didn't want to tell the story again about what they did with the other husband or the other wife. So oh. no one talked about it. It was forbidden. It was oh, yeah. family secret. In fact, it <laughs> heart pain for my mother because if you know the story well, you'll know yeah. my mother suffered deeply. She was two years old. So when she said, go talk to your grandmother, I don't think she quite knew that it would turn into a Ken Burns PBS film working with Facing History and Ourselves and the US Holocaust Museum and even honoring them at Yad Vashem. So that's where I wanna go. Let me get there. Um, let's so, go back to the fact that you're 14. Yep, 14. And you've just heard this incredible story. So, I'm going to assume that that led you to start getting really interested in World War II history mm -hmm. and researching. And then how old or at which point then did you decide, you know what, I've got to make a film of this story. And how did you get Ken Burns involved to, to work with you on that? Well, th that is the subject of about a two hour conversation, but I will give you five highlights. Okay, great. So when I was that little boy in recording my grandmother, I was also suffering from a disease called spinal muscular atrophy. Oh, okay. And I thought I was gonna die. Hmm. Doctors said I was gonna die. It was called juvenile ALS. And my grandmother came into my hospital room and said, "You." have to stop feeling sorry for yourself. We're gonna help other people. And I became the top tutor of the Bronx Boys and Girls Club teaching algebra. Everyone in my class got an A in algebra after they got me for a semester, everyone. And for me, algebra is like my second life. Like I love algebra. So it wasn't even about Jews at that point. It was really about um, helping people who were challenged. And then I went to my first Hadassah meeting. And for those who don't know Hadassah, it was started by a woman named Henrietta Zold. And my grandmother and her became best friends. And they conspired to bring over 100,000 Jews from the Levant and from Europe to Israel between 1945, at the end of the war, till the present. I think my grandmother is responsible indirectly or directly from pretty much 25 million Jews that live there now. Think about that. Wow. And what a beautiful, beautiful person she was. 
did it with Henry as old. And I would go to these Hadassah meetings and they would take my cheek and say, oh, you're so cute, you're so cute. <laughs> and they actually, actually auctioned me off for a day. I, I got <laughs> up to be the butler of this billionaire woman on the, you know, the Stanford, uh, Long Island Sound, you know, Palacio, because at this point, my mother is married to my dad. We live in Lebanon, Hong Kong, Italy, but we now live in New York. And Martha has been married to a very wealthy Jewish industrialist named David Kogan. Okay. And they buy a castle in Stanford, right on the Stanford Pier, a castle, like with armored mm -hmm. and a ballroom. And so my view of my grandmother is that she, the last thing she was interested in is Jews or helping people. And by the way, at that time, her Jewish family that had adopted her resented how many Jews she helped. So they never even proposed her to Yad Vashem. I see. Uh, uh, the only way to get into Yad Vashem is a witness or family member. Right. You can't get in there otherwise. So That's when, right. when I went, now I'm in postgraduate school. Um, my grandmother has died. I uh, endeavor to edit her biography, which now I oh. post on Amazon called Church Mouse in the White House. And the White House refers to being the first woman undersecretary in Truman's cabinet. Mm -hmm. And after that, her life from the time Truman was done until the present was Hadassah fundraising. And the way she raised money at these Hadassah fundraisers, she'd say, oh, that's a nice watch you're wearing. That could save a child. And one time a man took it off and said, here, $50,000 Rolex. What an incredible woman. I could use her for some fundraising for my Holocaust Institute right now. Right. Uh, and they married. That was David Kogan. I see. So, so it was about that time that you decided it was time to make this film defying the Nazis. Could you tell us, no, am I jumping way ahead? Yeah, well, just let me set it up one more second. Okay. I only promised my grandmother to publish her memoirs and I promised my grandfather to publish his. Right. And they are called The Liberation of the Human Spirit and Church Mouse in the White House. And I finally did that. But in doing that, I fell so deep about the story. I felt so compelled to be in the story. I wanted to know my grandparents. I actually wanted to know why they left their children, my mother, and went to Europe. Right. My mother was a very sad person for a long time that her parents were, were gone and she was sick. She had streptococcus, she was in the hospital. This is before penicillin. So when my parents, grandparents came home, my mother wouldn't touch my grandmother for two years. And well, then my grandmother sticking it out with her, she went to Washington to work with Truman. So every moment it was Waitstill who was the better father and it was my grandmother who left her. And, and, and all my life, I have lived myself with the pain of that abandonment. And I can imagine. the heroic of what she did to save this beautiful girl, Amelie yes. Holmstrom. So Amelie is one of the children. Yes. Was rescued by my grandparents in 1940 with her triplets. And if you see the film, there's a moment where three little girls are on the ship. <laughs> girl says, I want to thank you, America, for having me here. And thank you so much for the hot chocolate. What do you say, my love? You tell us. What did you say? Uh, well, well, I was, let, me, let me just go back a little bit before I call on Emily. Please. Because I have to follow things chronologically or I get very confused myself. Mm -hmm. And if I get confused, then the audience gets confused. Okay. So all I want to jump to before we introduce Emily is I want to talk about how incredible the risk that this couple, he's a Unitarian minister, they're a young couple, they have children of their own at home, they have a congregation, and they both risk 
going to Czechoslovakia, which they had traveled to before so many times to help get Jewish children out and non-Jewish children uh, out of uh, uh, it, out of harm's way. Uh, the risks that they took were amazing. I particularly loved being a romantic one moment in the film where they're writing love letters back and forth to each other. And I particularly was amused when your grandmother wrote to your grandfather, I mean, can you imagine in 1939, who was reading Lady Chatterley's Lover? And your grandmother was, and I saw right there in the film that she was an early feminist. So that was a beautiful moment. She was showing very early signs um, of being very independent. So I'm gonna skip a lot right now because I wanna introduce Emily. But for you viewers and participants, I assume you most of you saw the film. If you didn't, then where I'm skipping to now is already to the end where the second trip that they took, they came home and did their job in 1940, but then they were called to go back to Europe once again. And once again, they left their children, went back to Europe, helped people get out, by the way, my connection through Lisbon, where I was saved also, but not by your grandparents. And the last trip that they made, they saved a couple of hundred Jewish children and non-Jewish children as well. And there were a set of triplets. And the triplets are in that last scene as three young girls on the ship for those of you. And guess what we have for you here tonight? One of those triplets, beautiful, beautiful Amelia. Am I pronouncing it right? Holstrom. Amelia, wave, give a Hollywood wave to everyone. My name is Amelie. Amelie. Amelie, let's yes. talk. <laughs> now I'd like to hear from you. Tell us what that moment felt like with your twin sisters when you were saved, what, what it was like on the ship and how you adjusted and what you're doing with your life today. A lot, but... <laughs> well, yes, it was miraculous. That's the only word you can find because we never know what's going to happen. And I come from a very positive family. Mm -hmm. And they always said, don't worry what you don't have, but enjoy and share what you do have. So when we were moved to the ship with uh, Winstill and Martha Sharp, we waved to each other, knowing in our hearts that possibly we would never see each other again. But luckily, we did see each other again six months later. We went to New Jersey, where they had the Unitarian Church mm -hmm. welcome us. It was fantastic. They had beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, tablecloth and manners and elegance and heart, mostly heart. And as we stuck together, I said to my sisters, well, honey, we have each other but all the other children were single children. So let's do something. Let's divide the ship in three groups and we play mother. And so that all children had a home and a family. And that worked beautifully. How lovely. That's the sort of way we should all be. We should all put ourselves in the best possible health and shape we can so that we 
can help others to survive because nobody's life is easy, but every everybody's life is doable if we have support and love. Thank you. Emily, um, what happened to your parents? Well, my parents came six months later. Oh, good. And my father opened a dentistry office in Portland, Oregon. And we already had family in Portland, so that was very satisfactory. Uh, when we walked to our fate, we never thought these things could happen, but we knew in our heart that there was a God and he was protecting us. And our parents never made life ugly. They always said, don't worry, God is there. You each have an angel, a guardian angel. And when you get discouraged, which we all do at times, talk to your guardian angel and he will help you survive the moments of pain. And those are the things I like to pass on because the most important thing is that we believe, believe in ourselves, but most of all, believe in God and never give up. I still don't give up. I'm 93, I'm still here. I'm still I was gonna here. say, I, I wanted you to tell the audience how old you were because to me, you look like a beauty queen and you're 93 years old? 93. When will you be 94? 94 and I want more. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Angie, 94 on June 7th, 1927. And that, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> June 7th, 1927. Now, Emily, where were you born? Where were the I three was girls? born in Vienna, Austria. And, and do you? And are your sisters still living, both of them? Well, one, one sister, my little Marion, hello, darling, is in heaven. But okay. I, see, I see her every night in a, in a, um, in a heart, her oh, little face, wow. and we talk. And she says, I'm watching over you, and I know you're watching over me, so it's all right. You see, Marion and I were only two and a half pounds. And we weren't supposed to live at all. Evelyn was uh, seven pounds on her own. She was the leader. She was the mother, dear, you know, mother face. She, to this day, she is the one who takes care of everybody and is shy, but does her work so splendidly, sharing everything she has and does with each other and the world. Did you ever get a chance while you were growing up um, to meet Artemis's grandmother or anyone in his family? We did meet, we did meet, uh, I, my recall, because I have a stroke on the right hand and some of the memories are either very slow or faded, but I remember the voices of, of his family and we always, helped each other to help everybody. That's been our mission and that's been artist Moses. And, and where do you live right now, Emily? Uh, I live at the Rose Schnitzer Manor. Well, in what city do you live in? In Portland, Oregon. So it's you're in Portland. Assisted care. Assisted. I see. I and see that Artemis has a question or a comment. Uh, go ahead, Artemis, please. I know that you as an adult child of 16 met my grandmother, because I have a picture of my grandmother with you and your triplets, and it's published in the Unitarian Newsletter. And if you have never seen the picture, once you see the picture, you'll realize you knew her very well. I, I, I did know it, yeah. yeah. No, I have so, sent you the picture, and actually I'll try to post it on the group chat, you and, so, and the twins. Now, one of the things that's interesting about Amelie's story is- Speak a little louder, Artemis, please. Please. Things that's really exciting about Amelie's story is what the Sharps were able to do is get the children out first. And then now that the children were here, able to get the parents after. But Rosemary Feigl's family didn't get out because the same ship you guys got out on 
we sunk a year later and the parents were on that boat. Oh, 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 I see. That was when the blockade occurred and you could not travel from Lisbon to anywhere. So German I left a year later. I left a year later. I left in June, um, 1941. How did you from Portugal? Where did you go? Well, this isn't my story today. We'll talk about that another time because I still want to talk to Jeremy. But I have a couple of questions still to ask, Emily. Um, uh, what did you do most of your life? Did you have a career? Yes. I taught for 40 years. I taught French, German, drama, speech, and ballet. I used, oh to dance, I used to dance the Swan Lake. I used to be the, the dying swan. The dying, but I'm not dead. I'm not dead. <laughs> <laughs> and I still, to this day, I remember dancing in Versailles. We danced the Swan Lake. And I sang with Edith Piaf in Paris, La Vie en Rose. Oh my, do you want to sing a little bit for us, La Vie en Rose? Just a little bit. Dans ses bras, qu'il me parle si bas, je vois la vie en rose. <laughs> <laughs> and then I wrote songs. And the song that I wrote for the Biden administration is called Be a Mensch, Be a Mensch, Be a Mensch. Oh, a Mensch is a person. <laughs> who is capable and kind. A man is a person who speaks his own mind. A man is a person who cares and who cares. Be a man, be a man, be a man. And the important thing is a man is a person who respects all races, religions, and lifestyles. And with joy, hope, and courage carries on life to make life a little better for all of us. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. I'll come back to you, Emily. I want you to meet Jeremy Nazov, this young man over here. Jeremy, Hello, man. yeah, Jeremy That's is, a uh, he's a Jewish educator and non-educator generally for uh, the organization Facing History and Ourselves in Boston. And they have developed a curriculum for teachers and students on the film, Defying the Nazis. So we invited him because we want to show the world that's watching this film and everyone that yes, the film is shown to teachers and students and the curriculum has just been posted in the chat. Jeremy, talk to us a little bit about all of this. Well, hello, Miriam. I'm Dr. Kazanoff. It's a pleasure to be here. Dr. Um, Miriam. Amelie, <laughs> Dr. Miriam, as the students would say these days, and Artemis, of course, and um, thank you to Igor and Douglas and everyone at the Miami Jewish Film Festival as well. Um, it's a real honor to be here. You know, I think for me, one of the things that has just been continues to be made, made clear since I started learning about the Sharps and the story that Artemis was trying to tell is just what a facing history story it is. Um, from Artemis saying, you know, that it was a teacher who initiated this by asking or to go home and learn about your family history. Um, and that idea of starting with ourselves, with our own identity, learning what we would like to learn more about ourselves and what questions we want to know, and then investigating that personal history and the general history is what we believe of facing history can help move students to being civically engaged. Um, so, I, you know, it's just an incredible facing history story. And you see that particularly in the emphasis of choices in the um, story that Artemis tells. For facing history, that's what we constantly are going back to with students, having them look at choices that people made in history, understanding the context of those choices, that person's identity, that historical context, and what happened as a result of their choices. But I think it's also really important to acknowledge that sometimes history is made as much by the choices that weren't made. Um, if you look at what the Sharps did and how incredible it is and the ripple effects for positive and not, you know, Artemis has said this has had, there's a part of this history that's traumatic for his family. And I think we always need to understand what upstanders 
um, which is what I would call Amelie, which what I would call the Sharps, which is what I would call Artemis for telling the story, uh, what upstanders risk and give to us, what survivors like Amelie and Dr. Kazanoff give to us all by telling their story and what unique people they are for doing that. Not everybody can tell their story or chooses to tell their story. And we have to respect all of those decisions. And yet at the same time, let's really acknowledge those who do. Um, so, you know, just quick examples and, um, in this uh, curriculum that I just put up, um, Facing History uses this concept called the universe of obligation, where we get students to think about who they feel most obligated to. And it's an exercise for them to see how their world is structured and how they see it. And so for us, when we think about the universe of obligation of the Sharps, um, two people from Massachusetts with kids of their own, with families of their own, and yet they felt a deep obligation of humanity to people they never met before. And if we think about the positive ripple effects of that, Amelie here with us today, <laughs> which would be enough, right? But then we think about the millions and millions of other ripple effects, about Amelie being a teacher and how many lives you touched because you were able to do that. And I think about the ripple effects of this story that Artemis is telling. And when we bring it to, um, you know, about 12,000 students who have been reached by Facing History, um, about over 20,000 teachers in our network to bring this story to them and think about the possible impacts that um, learning about this history can have on our children today and the choices that they might make. Um, that's it in a nutshell. And so, you know, from Artemis's personal identity to learning his story uh, to the evidence of this history here in front of us, um, it's just really incredible. And as an educator, uh, as the grandchild of two Holocaust survivors myself, I'm just so grateful for you telling this story, Artemis. I'm so grateful, Amelie, for you being here and joining us um, and for the Sharps and what they did and the lessons that they hold for us. Um, so thank you, Miriam. Well, thank you. And you know, you just made me realize for the audience, this is an unusual experience. You have three generations of Holocaust survivors here. I'm a child survivor and Emily is also a child survivor and Jeremy is a grandchild of survivors. So that's really a wonderful uh, combination to be involved in this. And then of course, Artemis, who decided that these stories have to be told in honor and memory of the survivors. I'd like to go back to a moment in the film that really caught me. And I think that um, Jeremy, we can discuss this educationally. And of course, Artemis and Emily, just speak up when you want. There was that moment in the film when they'd just been in Europe. They'd just seen this horrible thing that's happening in Europe. And then they come back to America and life is just going on like normal. People are going to the movies, they're going out to restaurants, they're living their normal lives while people are being starting to be running dying yet not quite yet the camps haven't been established quite yet mm. but the fear and and you know the horror that's coming the contrast and it, i believe it was mentioned very strongly in the film and i think this is a real important part of history that our students need to know that um there was a lot of anti-semitism in america going on they did not want immigrants. They did not want the Jewish people. My father, what we went through to get our paperwork was incredible. They really did not want any immigrants. They sounds familiar, but we're not going to go there with contemporary politics. Uh, but uh, I thought that contrast was very interesting. Would you agree, uh, Jeremy? I From the educational point of view? Absolutely. No, I am sorry, I forgot I was on mute. Um, so, you know, I think for us at Facing History, one of the things we always want to build our students' ability to do is to address the universal and the particular. So we don't want to make facile and easy comparisons with moments in the past and say, oh, this is just like this, or so-and-so is just like that. 
but we do want to be able to see the universal connections in terms of human behavior, what we can learn about how humans act in these situations and the choices they make, um, again, for the purpose of prevention, um, and to see what's particular about certain histories. And you know, Miriam, as you and I were talking about, what is particular about this history of the Holocaust, the Jewish nature of this genocide, um, and other things, are that, those are examples that I believe these very specific stories very personal and inspiring stories can help students then be able to uh, use the critical thinking skills to discuss the, the, universe, the universality in the history we're looking at and the particular differences and learn from them. I have something. Uh, Artemis, yes, Artemis, please. Uh, I would like Lady first. gentlemen to know that I'm also the author of the Courtship of Life books. The first one is for children, how to raise children to know who they are and to know what they can do and what they can't do. And the, the second, it's called um, Conversations with Thomas. Thomas was my grandchild. The second book is Destined for Greatness and it was written for teachers. Oh. And, uh, I, I used to put all the students in a circle and we discussed all the possibilities for all of us. And then the third one was, yes, I can. That's for everybody. Mm -hmm. That nobody should ever give up on themselves because deep within our soul, if we believe, we can't fail. How beautiful. So you came up with, yes, I can, way before Barack Obama? Pardon? I said, did you discover the phrase, yes, I can, before Barack Obama, the president, did? Well, I don't know that. I know I wrote it on my own, so I, I, do yeah. not, I, I didn't get it from anywhere. I know. That's what I'm saying, that I think uh, that you were the first one that came up with that phrase. <laughs> I, I, I sent my, my books and all the information I can give to the Biden administration to Barack Obama, I, I, I send it to anybody who was a little bit discouraged about life and said, don't you ever give up because you are very important and life goes on through us, so we must participate. Beautiful. Before I go to Artemis, I want to encourage all 85 to 100 of you to please start putting your questions into chat because yeah. I'm sure you have many, many questions to ask of the panel. So please start putting them in. And in about, oh, five more minutes of other topics, uh, we're going to open the chat for you to ask your questions. I'm sorry, Artemis, so you had your hand up. So please, I, I enter want, the conversation. I wanted to just say that when I met Amelie, I fell in love. Uh. <laughs> you know the story Harold and Maud? Yes. <laughs> he's, well, you know, it's like, I'm not quite as bad as Harold, but she's like Maud. You know, this is a woman that I, I you know, would love to have married. Um, <laughs> and the fact that my grandmother helped her come to America yes. is like the best part of the story, but the story yes. never ends because we still love each other. Yeah, th th this is the legacy of your mother, Amelie. This is the legacy of all of our lives, because even you, Miriam, are part of this too. You're a child leaving from Lisbon a year later. I mean, are you kidding? After Pearl Harbor, we managed to get across Europe right, that's... on the heels of the Nazis and leave Lisbon. I want yes. to hear that story because I have never heard anyone getting out that late. Yeah. And um, I just want to know how you did it. I mean, it's miraculous. Well, when this show is over, I will send you the link of my lecture that's on Road Scholar, and you can hear it. I have a comment to make before we go to questions. I absolutely love the ending part where you show where all of the children, or many of them that were saved, where they are today. I love that part. They're doctors, they're professors, they're teachers. Can you imagine 
No. If your mother or your grandmother and your grandfather just saved those children, what we would have if right. the million and a half that weren't saved. Right. And that's just the tragedy of it, right. that there were a million and a half children like Amelie that right. could have been saved. Right. Um, finally, a personal question to you uh, before we go to Q&A, and I want to go there soon. I found it so sad, Artemis. Um, I didn't know until I watched the end that the marriage had to end. And yet, Waithfield says your grandfather, as devastated as he was of Martha wanting a divorce, mm -hmm. he would still, even, the, it, the words in the film were, by going and doing the humanitarian things that he chose to do, he lost his marriage, mm -hmm. but he would still have done it anyhow. Because to him, the most important thing in the world was the Talmudic saying, to save one life is to save a whole world. Yes. So what did you think about that, Artemis, as the grandchild now who knows that? that I would the, do the same. What do you think? I would do the same. And it goes to what Jeremy's talking about, upstanders. It's more fun to be an upstander. It's more fun to save lives. It's, up, uh, it's, it's more fun to jump in a river and save someone's life if you can do it, and, and not everyone can do it. You know, you can't always be an upstander. In the methodology of facing history, there are four kinds of people in the world. A victim, mm -hmm. a bystander, right. an upstander, and the bystander, meaning the person who watches it happen, doesn't do anything, and so many bystanders stood by, and so many upstanders more than we'll ever know. Now Yad Vashem has made declarations of 27,000 non-Jews who rescued Jews during the Holocaust. 27,000. Mm -hmm. There are only still five Americans and Martha and Waisel are two of the five Americans. Only Varian Fry, Luis Gordon, and a sergeant in, in the military, I forget his name, Buddy something or another, are the only five. And they had to go beyond three because what the hell? There can't be more than three. Now, Artemis, uh, were you invited to the Yad Vashem ceremony? Were you there? Oh, of course. Or you know, we had we had a state dinner with uh, the prime minister, private at the King David Hotel. Um, we had ten survivors who came on their own nickel. We had the Unitarians talking about why they did this work and why they're doing it in Sudan and, and Darfur and why they're doing it in you know, Cuba, why they're doing it everywhere. And then we had a representative from the International Rescue Committee, which was the organization that Barry and Fry inspired. And they are doing great work in the world, rescuing people. And then we had a, the president of Amnesty International, Bill Schultz, give the most rousing a speech about the Sharps. I mean, there was not a dry eye. My mother was crying. And you see, my vision of making this film wasn't just to honor my grandparents. It was to allow my mother and uncle to forgive their mom and dad for leaving them. Because- I just am so thrilled that I've had the opportunity to be a part and work with you a little bit and I hope that whatever other future programs you're gonna have with this film that you call on me because I want to be part of it. I'm gonna to go to the chat because we have some wonderful questions here. So I'm gonna go right to the top. Uh, Annie says, what an amazing heroic story. Um, this is Sandra Kaplan says, thank you so much. This is an incredible series and I'm learning so much. Um, let's see, um, Michael Feld says, Amelie, you are inspirational. Elaine Martin says, Artemis, do you have a close relationship with your own mother mm. or did you? No. Okay. Artemis, thank you for a wonderful film. Please. I will always, for whatever distance I feel from my mother, I know that she suffered 
the greatest, it's like the Sophie choice. Her mother made a choice to save all these other children, not her. And, you know, it's like the sound of one hand clapping. Like all of us are ultimately alone. Yeah. And mom learned that lesson young, younger than maybe she should have. But the most amazing thing is every child my grandmother rescued became a nanny, became a big sister, and stayed in my mother's life all her life. And when we did our event at the White House, the White House, we had 40 members of her rescues there in person. And I want to acknowledge Peter Meyerhoff is on the phone, and his grandfather was rescued by Waitstill, and he was a Nobel Prize winner of physics. Really? Three. Mr. Mayerhoff then was taken with his luggage, my grandfather carried his luggage over the Pyrenees to the University of Pennsylvania. And Peter, can you speak up somehow or send a chat to everyone about the uh, this story for you? Yeah, it's a webinar, so he can't speak up, but he can certainly send a chat and I'll read the next one and we'll see if his comes through. From Sherry Spitzel, Emily, I love you and everything you say, you are my role model. Thank you for all you have accomplished and for all whom you inspire. Uh, from Shira Leibovitz, Schmidt in Israel, did other ships with Jewish children follow the one that Martha organized. Yes, my ship left in June 1941. It was called the um, Ciudad de Seville. I was on it as a five-year-old and my infant brother, Ted, who was only um, 13 months old. And there were many other children on that one too. Um, is it true that Eleanor Roosevelt was involved? Eleanor Roosevelt got involved in um, the one, I can't think of the name of it, but you know, we did the show with Olivia where nobody wanted us. Do you know which ship that was, Artemis? I can't think of it right away. The St. Louis. Uh, no, not the St. Louis. Uh, there was a ship um, where, uh, I can't think of the name of it, uh, the film Nobody Wanted Us. Uh, it got stuck in um, uh, Virginia and uh, letters were sent to Eleanor Roosevelt to see if she could help with that one. Lucille Safair, what an inspiring story. Uh, Ida Margolis, who's a friend of mine, wants to know, was the other at Yad Vashem Roddy Edmonds? Yes. I don't know the answer. Do you, Artemis? Do you, Jeremy? Yes. Yes. Artemis? Yes. Can I, okay. before you go on, can I say something about Eleanor? Sure. The longest research project of my life was to discover whether Martha and Eleanor ever knew each other. Okay. Because we know, we found, because of Ken Burns, a telex that Eleanor sent to the State Department instructing them to rescue Wuchik. Woo chick, hot luggage. Way still rescued Woo chick. His name was Leon Feuchwanger. He was at that time among the most celebrated Jewish authors and an anti Nazi. And Varian Fry was brought into the rescue. They, everyone, all the all stars were involved in the rescue. They, they disguised him and his wife. They went on the train to Norbonne, then they got off the train of Norbonne, and we showed this in the film. And then they put him back on the train, and Wastel was heart beating like this until he got him on a boat to Lisbon to America. Wow. And then imagine that conversation where, where Feuchtfanger asks Wastel, what kind of man are you that you would do this? Like, who are you? And it describes Jeremy, you're the one, what an upstander is. And, and an upstander is, I don't like people to bully other people. I don't like to plead. Thank you, Artemis. Your friend Peter Meyerhoff has written, in December 1942, two years after your grandfather rescued my grandparents from Vichy, France, my grandfather wrote, quote, 
when the history of the American liberation of Europe from the Nazi yoke will once be written, the role played by the heroes of humanity in the Unitarian Service Committee in France shall not be forgotten. So he is responded to, to you. And Artemis throws you a kiss, Peter. From Vivian Shapiro, Artemis, I see a movie coming out about Emily and her story and what she has given the world as a result of being saved. So we need to do that, Emily. We need to make you a movie star now. Good heavens, good heavens. All I <laughs> Please do is the film. contribute anything at any time that would make anybody happier. Emily, tell the story of being uh, filmed with your son and, and Elijah Blitz, because that's what we are going to do, is we're going to make a 3D representation of Amelie that is standing in front of a Holocaust museum saying, hello, I'm Amelie, who are you? <laughs> we'll sing her songs. She will introduce people to her. It will be a 3D uh, virtual reality experience. And we've already filmed it, Amelie, as you know. Uh, Tell that experience, Amelie, of making that film. Um, the ship was the Kwanzaa. Thank you to uh, Marilyn, Vivian, and Fred Ball, and Carol S. Uh, and Lucille Sepper. From Carol S. to all panelists, Eleanor Roosevelt convinced FDR to have the immigration status of the SS Kwanzaa refugees evaluated. State Department sent Patrick Murphy to assess the situation in Norfolk, Virginia. So all the questions are done, but before we finish, I want to hear Emily sing La Vie en Rose one more time. Please, a chorus of uh, La Vie en Rose, please. Des yeux qui font baisser les miens, un doux sourire sur sa bouche, voilà le portrait sans retouche, ce l'homme auquel j'appartiens. Quand il entre dans ses bras, qu'il me parle si bas, je vois la vie en rose. Il me dit des mots d'amour, des mots de tous les jours, et ça me fait quelque chose. Il est entré dans mon cœur. Il me parle du bonheur dont je connais la cause. C'est lui pour moi. Moi pour lui dans la vie. Oh, I love it. 